Mark, welcome to the Naked Dialogue podcast. How are you doing? What's up? I'm good. Um, glad to hear you. How are you doing? Fine, just relatively tired from like the class, but fine. Yes. Yeah, understandable. I had classes too today. <laughs> yeah. How many classes did you have? Um, I think about two, but I was working beforehand, so. Yeah, that's tiring enough. Um, so tell me about yourself. Tell the world who you are and what do you like. Just go off. Well, I'm not going to tell much. Uh, probably just some uh, general information that's going to be related to our talk. Um, I'm a student in university, majoring in philosophy, minor in psychology. Um, I wouldn't say that uh, I'm interested in something particular. I'm interested generally in everything that can bring uh, purpose or uh, some interest in experiences uh, and influence my life to a certain degree. So I'm open to a uh, variety of spheres and variety of information. Um, so yeah, I think that's uh, enough in terms of general information and uh, anything uh, we can Anything that you're interested, you can ask later on and you can be more specific about it. Yeah. So like, what's your goal with this degree itself? Like, do you like, did you plan on to do this degree or was it like uh, something that was right there in front of you? You thought that you should take this opportunity and do this degree and figure because liberal arts is like a program wherein you have all these, you know, humanities faculties and people, you know, usually go in, in with the intention that they can choose uh, a certain subject and like explore the subjects and then choose the particular subjects they're interested in. So like right now we're in the third year of our program. So what, what do you think about this program? Do you like it? Have you figured out any particular interests or are you still figuring out? Uh, well, look, it's it's generally a tough question because at the same time you're asking about everything and then you're asking uh, about something particular. I think uh, I will start with the last question of yours related to uh, me uh, liking the program or uh, me not enjoying it. I think um, in general, I wouldn't say I'm here for the program. Um, I chose liberal arts uh, because of philosophy and psychology. Um, just to fulfill my future plans related to uh, the career, uh, to uh, business management or administrative management, uh, or uh, in general logistics, let's say. Um, it's just, I believe that in order to uh, start dealing with um, harder spheres, not even harder, but uh, more uh, spheres that involve management or management of people, management of structure, uh, making sure that everything works, uh, accordingly and uh, uh, or you can create a specific uh, creative way of uh, solving a problem you need to have a, spe a specific basis uh, um, in general I know for sure that uh, my future career is going to be involved um, with the people and uh, currently the job I had well I still have I was just sent on the unpaid leave uh, during the due to the pandemic COVID-19 um, I would say that um, philosophy was a necessary subject, um, so, was, so was psychology. Uh, later on, I think, in a small period of time, it developed into not just a necessity, but something that became a valuable, dear, and uh, um, an important topic that was involved in my life. I feel like definitely you need to know a bit of philosophy, or at least a ethics part of the philosophy in order to go for any kind of business MBA degree uh, area and yeah it is very interesting what you're doing uh, of course like the COVID-19 pandemic has affected everyone's long-term goals in the sense that they have affected like the long-term decision making of people so that's also you know understandable I mean talking about like ethics and, and philosophy and business do you feel like um, you're interested like within philosophy as a broader subject are you interested in 
edtechs particularly because you're interested in business or you feel like you like to uh, explore more other faculties of philosophy like philosophy of language philosophy of mind in order to like broaden your viewpoint of life and existence and and more you know ontological questions like that well look i think um it's not the first option or the second option that you gave i think that um it's not a question of is it philosophy for business or it's business for philosophy it's a question that both of those fears are heavily correlated if it's not even the question about business, it's a general question. If you're planning to work with people, in my understanding, you cannot work with people without know knowing the basics. The basics, the basis are the philosophy, the psychology, the way you understand people. And uh, of course, um, you can start, as many do, uh, start specific careers from the bachelor degree and just go specifically studying, let's say, business administration and just do that for bachelor's, then continue doing it for master's and so on. Uh, and then get MBA degrees after you get some work experience, perhaps. But I do believe that um, there is a reason why when you choose philosophy, let's say for bachelor's or major, majoring in philosophy, uh, for when you're applying to master's, you can practically apply to majority of master's. Of course, I'm not speaking about uh, programs that involve um, exact sciences such as physics or chemistry, because that's a completely different story. Or if you want to be a doctor, of course, you cannot apply with philosophy. But in general, um, you can apply to the same business administration and master's or um, financial management or anything that you would desire. You can receive the same ba basis and master's and then continue on uh, in, to MBA. It's just, I believe that, of course, it's it, the mathematical knowledge would be easier to, uh, to understand because I believe that, uh, and it's not just even the question of me believing in it. If you look at the first philosophers that existed um, or even the fathers of philosophy, the Greek, philosoph uh, the Greek philosophers, um, it's, um, it's easy to understand that they were not just interested in the way they were thinking or people are thinking, but mainly in, uh, in all the spheres. So uh, they were interested in mathematics, they were interested in physics, they were interested in how the whole world, how the whole universe works. And I think this is very important to understand. The same with even contemporary philosophers. Um, we can speak about the father of modern philosophy, which everyone uh, who is studying liberal arts is fed off, well, such as uh, Descartes. But nevertheless, Descartes is an amazing human being who was not just a philosopher, but he, and not just a profound thinker, he was a scientist. His works on optics are uh, incredible. And uh, you cannot just uh, study philosophy without not studying any other sphere. It's just this subject allows you to understand that there is no uh, sphere in the world that is not interesting or is not worth studying, it's just your own preference. It opens your eyes to a certain degree. Yeah, no, indeed very true because um, you reference Greek philosophy and I mean it is important to establish that philosophy was like the first subject ever to exist and philosophers like Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, they were not only studying the general idea of the world in a very a uh, philosophical term, but they were also studying the philosophy of mathematics, geometry. We had Pythagorean, Pythagoreans come up and there's like a whole series of, you know, philosophy based sciences that came out later. Uh, but yes, it is definitely interesting to see that philosophy is the one subject that allows people to be examining everything instead of, you know, just something like particulars i mean yes there are particulars but the particulars are obviously going to come out of a very broadened sense of uh, a subject and so philosophy was the first subject and there came in you know mathematics geometry um, exact sciences as you mentioned and and just other other fields in general so in what exact sphere of philosophy do you most find yourself being uh, comfortable with or thinking the most about? Well, again, I would say, I would answer that with uh, the sentence that you already heard that uh, it's relatively a hard topic because, you know, when, when we're speaking about like even the Greek philosophy, I wouldn't say that I'm, I have profound knowledge in either Greek philosophy or contemporary philosophy, or um, if I would even divide it to Western and Eastern, 
Um, I think it's important to understand it's not a question of profound knowledge or having immense amount of knowledge uh, or being able to talk about every single topic or about a particular topic in um, huge depth. It's a question of um, understanding that there is a lot of knowledge that one has to accumulate. And uh, I think one of the ways to approach it is uh, the way Socrates was approaching it as well. The way um, that you cannot admit that you are all-knowing creature. You cannot admit that you know things because as soon as you know things, it means that you saying yes or no, you're saying something particular, you're saying that there is 100% possibility of this uh, thing that I'm speaking about. And of course, if I will say that I know something that uh, means that I'm uh, um, I'm studying philosophy in a wrong way, in my understanding. I'm studying philosophy not to know something, but just to know more. There is no point where I will say that uh, I'm 100% sure about something. Uh, I will never uh, completely agree or disagree with something. I think everything should be looked uh, from both sides. Or perhaps there is a third side. You don't have to necessarily just fall into the false dilemma of just two options, which uh, our world is used to. I think in general, I'm interested in uh, all kinds of philosophy. I think every author that was published uh, that was paid attention to uh, in specific time in history uh, deserves uh, attention. Um, of course, um, it's my decision in the end of the day to say after I read him or her that um, it's interesting or it's not interesting, but it's merely my opinion, but it still doesn't cancel out um, that I shouldn't read him or I shouldn't read her. You know, it's uh, the idea that in order to speak about something, you have to experience it. And even if you think that this is something that you already know, well, there, there might be some kind of new information. And uh, if it is the same information that you already read before, well, perhaps it's also good because you know, you just repeating information is not a bad thing or rereading something is not a bad thing. I, I reread paragraphs, I reread books. I try to uh, go over the material uh, over and over again, because every time I read something, I understand something better or actually come to new conclusions, which of course probably existed before me, but you know, it's still nice to understand that every time you read something, you can find uh, some new piece of information. Based on what you said, I think it is fair to understand that you take philosophy as an enjoyable mental activity. Uh, in order to better understand the world or the immediate external reality around you. And so you see it as a subject worth reading, worth knowing, as opposed to worth uh, collecting in terms of information. So you see philosophy as, as a mental activity, um, which is completely beautiful because that's how it should be you know, studied as. If you're trying to accumulate as much knowledge as possible, then it defeats the purpose of having the knowledge and being able to articulate the knowledge well, because it only implies that you're collecting knowledge in order to uh, prove certain standard of the society, who knows? If philosophy is taken as like a mental activity wherein a person genuinely interested in the subject sits down, opens their book, goes through all these philosophers, their ideas, and they try to apply their implications onto the external reality of their own and, and come to their own philosophical conclusions, that's how philosophy truly should be or started as. I mean, do you believe in... Um in that way of studying? I mean, you of course, you just said that this is uh, the right way of studying it. But for example, how do you study philosophy yourself? Because I understand you're very into the subject in general, too. So uh, what, what's your approach in it? Do, are you studying specific particular part of philosophy, let's say? Uh, are you taking, uh, yeah. Uh, like for me, I feel like liberal arts was a good um, starting point uh, in order to start uh, learning about what philosophy really is um, and I feel like this was probably the first time I was exposed to the western philosophy as opposed to esoteric philosophy or 
or theological philosophy, mystical philosophy that I grew up, you know, knowing about living in an Eastern society. But um, philosophy, just as a, as a broadened subject, I feel like I got to discover it when I started reading, you know, Descartes and all these uh, main uh, figures in philosophy in university. Um, and I figured out like the way to learn is not to accumulate all the knowledge because I would go to classes, I would go to uh, lectures and you know, there are people just talking, just like not even talking and explaining points, but like spitting points. So there's like a difference between spitting knowledge and, and you know, exposing uh, your ideas about knowledge to the uh, people around you. And, and I figured out that distinction really quick. And so the way I read philosophy from that point to now is that if I'm interested in a particular section or if I go to a particular reader, maybe you know the professor talked about it in class or I saw a YouTube video, I would dive into it, but I would not learn it in order to accumulate knowledge. I would learn it in order to understand what the subject matter is really about. So I feel like, you know, now I, after two years of more or less, like jumping through to philosophers and philosophers, it's like, I, I got to learn so much, but only because I wanted to. And I, I, and, and the way I would, you know, like jump from philosopher to philosopher made me understand exactly what kind of philosophy I like. And so that basically narrowed down to philosophy of mind in general. Um, and how there's a distinction between mind and body. So that's where Descartes comes in. And you mentioned earlier how, you know, Descartes and Kant also probably people are heavily fed up. Uh, whoever is like a philosophy student out there, you know, the, at least in like a, an undergraduate degree, there's a lot of Kant and Descartes references in every possible year, every possible um, subject that you take uh, in your uh, year. They, they, keep, they keep on repeating the same uh, names, uh, like Descartes and Kant, but I feel like both of them are heavily important because they were the ones who at least shaped the way we see you know, philosophy as a divided science today. So we have metaphysics, we have ontology, and we have epistemology. And within that, you know, some people would divide ontology to meta-ontology. So we only get all those distinctions from these two main philosophers. And so I feel like in order to really understand what philosophy is, is you have to keep, you have to jump into whatever the subject matter is in front of you it, with, the, with the mindset that you're going in there to understand what they're talking about, but not trying to learn, oh, so X plus X is going to be this, you know? Um, so like, what do you think about, uh, <laughs> philosophy of mind um or if you're interested well, in philosophy of language because i know you you're interested in a bit of linguistics and semantics uh, i mean i wouldn't really dive into semantics or um uh, in general linguistics because of course it's interesting but uh, it's just too often abstract topic that um we can speak about, but um, I think it's important to speak about something that you can actually apply to life, uh, apply to reality, because when you're speaking about uh, philosophers as Descartes or Kant, who you uh, mentioned as those uh, uh, who are being studied in university the most, I mean, th their philosophy, at least you can apply to reality, um, such as, oh, doubt everything, you know, well, th that you can actually apply, don't trust, this, don't trust your senses or don't trust something that was established before. Of course, there are things like mathematical knowledge that you have to uh, trust and you have to acknowledge. But in the end of the day, it's still important to ask yourself questions. In my understanding, it's important to acknowledge that there are other philosophers uh, or profound minds in general, academic, academic scholars who are uh, much more, not much more, but actually are as important as Descartes or Kant. And I believe that university does study them a lot but you, you can apply, you know, uh, theoretics of Foucault. You, you can look at the way he observes uh, our reality and the way he's saying when Kant was trying to say, oh, it's important to find, you know, universal laws. Well, in the end of the day, something is disproven at certain point. His universal ethics and morals were disproved at certain moment. And um, I think that's what important to acknowledge. It's not 
it's not the most important to find the universals, as Foucault would say. It is sometimes just important just to question them. You don't have to find it. You, 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 you can just question them. And perhaps just from this questioning, you can get uh, more information or more knowledge than before, because every try time you try to find something, you try to define something, you're creating a new system. And this creating and this creation of new system is is kind of wrong because in the end of the day you are trying to find a center of something and this is where uh, which you mentioned uh, that I'm interested in linguistics I will uh, I, I didn't want to dive into but in the end of the day I um, it, it's happening so you know when you're finding when you're trying to find a center of something you're trying to define something and this is you creating a structure and this is where if uh, this is where I would recommend to read Derrida because he uh, position, positioned himself as someone who was whose job was to find the center and to take it out, to decenter it. This is where we come across the idea of decentering the center, uh, which is very important to understand because every time we're trying to find something and as soon as we find it, what, what's next? What happens when we define the structure? How can you ask questions? How can you continue searching for new answers if you have the center, you have the structure, and everything seems kind of working? You cannot go beyond that. Everything that you create beyond that is not going to make sense. So you have to decenter the center in order to continue uh, searching for something. But this is just a post structuralist approach, which of course is just uh, important to understand and to know that it exists. But this is where we are probably going to take our talk towards the Greek philosophers that we're just asking the question what, you know, and just trying to uh, define the basic things, which are not actually basic. And I'm speaking about things, what, what is truth, for example. And I, I, I bet uh, no one is going to answer this question just in one sentence or two sentences or even a paragraph. It's uh, or even a book. Uh, a lot of people have, de have tried to define it. And people define it in a variety of different terms, depending on the time and uh, so on. But um, I think it's just important to understand that um, modern inst institutes forget about certain philosophers, such as Greek philosophers, who were there in the beginning, because everything takes roots from something. And there is, it's important to acknowledge that. And for example, the same Kant or <laughs> the same Descartes wouldn't exist without those Greek philosophers. Of course, some of them had bizarre ideas and I'm speaking about Aristotle and, and 80% of his writings, which were uh, very bizarre, but uh, very interesting to read because it's just, um, it's, uh, it's impressive to see how a uh, human mind can come up with something that is that absurd, that abstract, and I wouldn't even call it absurd in a bad way, it's just how a human mind can define something. And this, uh, this creation of the system uh, and the uh, and the continuation and the way we continue to create those systems is fascinating, but sometimes it's not about creating something; it's just trying to find the answers for something that already exists. So, so what are your views on reductionism as opposed to post-structuralism? Here, I wouldn't even um, refer to. Um, I, I mentioned post-structuralism just to uh, mention one of the latest waves of. Uh, the modern, the contemporary scholars attempting to define something, to deal, in the end of the day, the same Derrida by saying that, well, we have to, you know, decenter the center because someone already found the center. He 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 kind of coined the term, <laughs> so he he created the system himself. So in the end of the day, it's everything is paradoxical. Yeah, the like someone is trying to destroy the system by creating another system, and in the beginning, one had a name to to destroy the system so it doesn't exist. But by in the process, another one was created. So it's important to understand that everything works on a specific meta level. So in reductionism goes to a certain degree, we're always trying to reduce something. But I will ask you a different question here. Well, why do you believe we're trying to reduce everything? Why do you think reduction? And why, why we're simplifying everything? I think I would uh, go back to your Derrida point that we're trying to decenter the center. Uh, and reductionism would already be like another mechanism, another structural way in order to get to that center. 
because we're reducing everything, we're reducing every material object or immaterial experience to this one particular uh, reduced element. And that's also in one way can be interpreted as coming to the center or coming to the truth with the capital T. It's, it's, it's but, like but, take all these different approaches where we're going towards the same you know, end conclusion or we're trying to seek the same conclusion if we're not going to it. That answers my question to a certain degree, but I think I'm trying to, I'm going to repeat my question. What, why do you think we're over, we are simplifying everything as human beings? Because you just gave the definition of decent, you just basically explained why we are decentering to like, what, what's how decentering works. But why do we as human beings always tend to simplify everything why do we why are we trying to take this enormous amount of information enormous amount of something and just try, try to reduce it to just one something isn't it the same as trying to find the answer in the end of the day we're just eliminating something so it's easier for us to understand don't you think so yes yeah, like at the top of my head i would say it's 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 just another mechanism of trying to understand something fully so in order to grasp something fully you would reduce everything all the way down to this one thing and just say, oh, this is the, the this is a source of this whole process or of this whole structure. And, and so, you know, reductionism would also be just a way of trying to understand a particular situation to the, to its core, core uh, you know, level of understanding that one can possibly attain. So it's already, you know, simplifying understanding, which as you said, it's completely true. So I, I think that uh, that answers your question in terms of my position of reductionism and post-structuralism. I, I, I believe they're the same to a certain degree and us creating something new or creating specific new systems is just us changing uh, the name of it. It's the same idea as we have in the contemporary world saying that rebranding. What happens when you do rebranding? You create a new label so it looks different, cool, and then you create a different name but in general, it's the same thing. It's just, it has a different name. It perhaps looks different, but it acts the same. So it's just, it has a different effect on people. So it always existed. And that's in my understanding, there is no need of trying to identify what part uh, you prefer, what system you prefer. It's important to acknowledge that, well, both of those systems exist and it's important to look um, it's not just it's important not just to compare which one is better but it's also important to find the comparison and this is where also Derrida comes in handy because he was by his term deconstruction he was also you know he was telling to telling us that if there is a coin and the coin has two sides when we, let's say when we're speaking about men and women and we're speaking about their uh who, who is standing who who is there on the top that it is a man's society, it's a women's society, and so on. Like, why would we try to find the differences? Because in the end of the day, men ca cannot exist without women, and women cannot exist without men. It's important to look on both of those sides. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to go somewhere deep in the topic or try to have an effect on sensitive sides of this argument. It's just I'm in general say so you can take any any argument like that. It's the same left or right. Why would you look at just left and right or good and bad? What's the point of choosing between one another? It's important to look at both of those sides in order to understand the full picture, because this is the only way one can understand the full picture. You cannot choose between, you, you have to accept the whole. And only when you accept the whole, and when you speak about the whole, then you can, uh, in my understanding, uh, gain specific amount of knowledge. And even then, it pro it's, it's probably gonna be wrong or it's probably going to be right, but it's not going to be an ending point where you have you can finish with the topic. It will continue. You will always discover something new. So th that's my understanding of when you compare post structuralism or reductionism. There is you, you can define both of them, but in general, it's important to acknowledge that both of them exist and they actually pursue a similar kind of idea uh, in general, even though they have different kind of definitions. Yeah, no, that's very true. Like, it makes me think how even, you know, when you take the mind and brain argument or the argument of empirical or esoteric, uh, you know, there's always like there's two kinds of uh, main, you know, ideologies existing within our civilization towards, you know, what is the structure of reality? Some people would look at it empirically 
look at it through the lens of science, through physics, through quantum mechanics, and there are people who would see it through the medium of, through theological definitions or mystical explanations, through navigating through mythologies and saying, oh, you know, there's, there's an external higher power. But science is also in, in a way trying to uh, like find that one particular answer, like where are we coming from? Where are we going, you know? Uh, I had like one of my friends uh, on this podcast who said that there are, you know, five main questions about who, how, what, where, and when. And so we're all trying to, you know, navigate through all these different questions in order to understand reality. Either you choose the empirical way of understanding it, or you choose like the mystical and esoteric way of understanding it. But at, but at the same time, we're all just trying to seek one answer and and it's out there somewhere and everyone has a certain amount of time in their lifetime where they can reflect on it. But ultimately it's the same answer we all as human beings are seeking. And what do you think this answer is if you're saying that there is um, one answer that in my understanding, just to say, I, I wouldn't say I agree with it or not, because uh, again, I, as I mentioned before, I'm not going to be on a particular side of anything. I, I, I'm just interested in examining something. And here, uh, I, um, I want to believe that there is one answer. And it's a very cool possibility that there is one universal thing that answers everything. But then I'm also thinking that, well, why is it bad to have more than one answer? Why a human being cannot have an answer for just oneself? Because in the end of the day, I mean, um, there, there is a possibility of me perhaps finding something the way uh, we pursue life, the way what, what gives me happiness. It's the same as Seneca, you know, uh, a Roman stoic, one of the first ones who actually uh, discovered and uh, created the school of stoicism, you know, he, he was arguing about um, the shortness, shortness of our life and the way we deal with it, because some people are uh, not wasting, but spending their whole time on creating their career, pursuing the, the career path, going for the money. Some people are pursuing the path of uh, creating a family, you know, and the family can be uh, spoken about in a variety of terms as uh, spe speaking about the blood, uh, blood relations, or just creating friends who are, are becoming your family, you know, and uh, so on. Some people are just uh, wasting. In fact, they're wasting their time on uh, different purposes, trying to, to uh, trying to define something that shouldn't be even defined. It just should be uh, accepted as it is, more of Eastern philosophy, you know, uh, acceptance. In general, he was just speaking about one simple idea that there is no reason to, uh, you know, there is just one simple understanding that life will come to an end in a certain way at a certain moment and we don't know when but the beauty is that we shouldn't waste our life and we, we should always be active we should not just pursue something we shouldn't just pursue that something that we call happiness because in our world we speak a lot about something that um, a lot of people ask what do you desire so what what happened what is happiness in your understanding and for majority of people it's money for example well, do money actually bring you happiness? I mean, we, we can look at some of the Roman emperors who, uh, who were desiring and speaking about the fact that they had everything, they had all the blessings of the gods, but then how much they desired just to have one day with the, of, of their work without solving governmental problems, without being there for everyone, of just having this one single moment of life where th this was a moment about them and not them thinking about someone. So this happiness, which exists in terms of money or power, well, in the end of the day, our preferences change once we get to this stage. And suddenly when we have money, we desire something else. We desire to be not poor, but we desire not to have all these resp responsibilities and so on. So it's like a reverse role. And uh, in my understanding, that's also important to acknowledge that when you choosing specific something, it's important to understand that with this specific something, there is responsibilities that are gonna come in and you have to think even to that point. Additionally, it's 
the true happiness is when, in my understanding, is when you choose something and you say, well, you know, I will think of the way how I will achieve it and I will spend my time achieving it. And when you achieve it, you create a new goal. And these goals should just continue existing because this is what particularly defines you. In my understanding, what is a human being uh, which says that, well, I, I have a fulfilled life. How can you fulfill your life? It means that you reach everything that, let's say, an omnipotent and an omnipotent uh, being can achieve. And that's when we're speaking about something higher than a human being in general. So here I wouldn't say that, of course, we desire, this, is, this all comes from our desire to be closer to this God figure to this someone universal who, as you're saying, uh, that, that's the reason why we're trying to find this one answer. But I mean, th there, is, there, is, there is this someone <laughs> who knows one answer perhaps. And why, why are you trying to, to be that? You, 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 we human beings will never be able to achieve. And we actually don't in my understanding need to be gods or a god or whatever. It's, it's a question of us just um, knowing that we are imperfect and being imperfect is beautiful. It's beautiful to not fulfill something, to not fulfill something. You don't have to completely get to 100 degree, 100 percent, because then it, it's 100 percent. You cannot be, go beyond that. And that's my understanding. Although, of course, you can argue that there is something beyond the 100 percent because this is the way we structure the world. But still, it's just you shouldn't create an ending point of anything. You should create something after something after something after something. And at this moment, you create your own beautiful universe, your beautiful reality, where you will strive, you will want to become better. And um, I think that answers your question to a certain degree related to one answer of everything. There is no one answer for everything in my understanding. And if there is, well, I praise those people and I would like to speak with those people because I, I, I'm sure they're very enlightened and I'm sure they will enlighten me as well to a certain degree. Uh, but uh, in my understanding, those who know the answer for everything and is just one answer, they're gods. So it would be pretty amazing to meet up with the god, but uh, I don't think there is anyone who is alive who can do that. But it's a beautiful utopia where, um, it's a beautiful utopian world where one can um, exist, so. Mm -hmm. No, like going back to when you asked me what's the one question or what's the exact one answer to that one question we're looking for, what comes into my mind is like maybe we're trying to find at an effective level the existential meaning behind this life that we're given, right? And the other way, the other opposed to the effective way of thinking about this is that we're trying to find out why we're here which is again you know effectively connected but the models can differ like we can say that distinctly in a in a esoteric in a philosophical way we're trying to find this one particular meaning behind life like what we're given this life what should we do with it and then we have on the other hand oh why are we here uh, looking at it from an empirical point of view or is this a simulation uh, or um, questions like that in general so uh, yes i mean you're very correct in saying that there are a lot of answers and if every if a one person is able to know all these answers his purpose in life is somewhat like not there anymore or he or she might not want to be able to uh, look at other um, you know questions because all questions are answered if all questions are answered as you said you're probably a god which is 100 percent true and so you know this thing comes into my mind. Albert Camus committed suicide because he thought that he had, um, and I mean, as far as I've read uh, in articles on the internet that he thought that he had completed or for some reason life had no more reason uh, for in, in order for him to exist. So that's also like a very different outlook that throughout his career, he published all these different sorts of books, very interesting books. Um, but like he committed suicide in the end because he he was like oh life ha like life has absolutely no fucking meaning to it and so that kind of like makes you think okay so if there is a meaning that we're trying to look for 
at an effective level are and even if we achieve it then you know what's the what's the point like what's more to it is there anything more to answering questions or it's only that we were given the siphon so we're just going to experience it to our best potential and figure out as things you know go along the timeline if we're able to achieve all the answers we become the god which we're trying to you know understand which is very interesting if you if you look at it through this lens I read his works and um, I, I'm aware of how he finished his life, but in my understanding that, yeah, like how do you know that, my general question that I would like to ask is, how do you know that you've, you, that you are done with the life? How do you know that you completed your, your meaning? And in my understanding, this is where we can take even Nietzsche's approach of being master of your own, uh, being masterful. And here you have to be masterful in terms of we are the ones who create our own meaning. No one is forcing us. If I would like to sit on the sofa, sofa all day and watch TV, this is my, purely my decision. But I also, I'm also aware that if I decide to take a book and read it, perhaps something I, I, will, I will have interesting conclusions, I will have more knowledge and I would be able to meet new people. But sit, just sitting on the sofa, and I'm just deriving that from I can read a book at home, I can go to the uh, coffee shop and read a book there, uh, I can even sit on the bench outside and read a book. Uh, and uh, this will create a lot of different interactions, but we, we are the creators of our own uh, fate. It's, we, we can all, of course, argue that there is a domino effect and, of course, you know, everything was, uh, whatever we do is perhaps something that uh, is because of something that happened thousands of years, years ago. And, of course, it's cool. You can look at it that way. And it comes to the question of freedom, that the beauty of being a human being is that we, we decide what we can do. Of course, we are limited to a certain degree. Of course, we are uh, everywhere, we're in chains, you know, even though we have this kind of freedom that surrounds us. It's not really true, but the freedom that we do have is the freedom of our certain actions, uh, the freedom of uh, um, choosing what path are, uh, would we like to pursue. And for example, in your understanding, it's you would like to pursue academic path, which is beautiful. And the only person who uh, decided that you would want to pursue the academic path is you, no one else. No, not your parents, not your friends, it was your decision. You could have chosen career path, you could have chosen, you could have said that, well, you know what, I would like to start working in a shop and I would work as a cashier and then, you know, I would be a top cashier and then I'll become a manager and so on and continue down this path. But you said, no, I would like actually to spend my life studying. I would like to be a scholar and this suits me so much that um, I, I don't want, I don't wish anything else. And this is completely your choice. And this is what I would say being masterful. Certain, a large amount of people believe that there is a specific uh, fate, that there is a specific uh, path that is indicated for everyone. Of course, we are limited by things like bureaucracy. Of course, we have to, for example, get a degree in order to have a specific a job in the world. Because certain jobs you can't apply just without degree. You cannot just come in and say, "Well, I'm 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 that and that." Uh, the next the, one of the first questions which you will have is, "Well, can we see your CV?" You cannot just run away from it. You have to have work experience. You have to have uh, finished. You have to have a degree from high school, let's say from university, from MBA, whatever. Some people have different CVs, but you have to have this just like a piece of paper, which basically opens different gates for you. And everything that works in our world is particularly, uh, or in general, uh, works on the specific diff specific papers, you know. So we can look at it through that way, but it's you being masterful. It's you deciding that I know for sure that if I want to work in the company named X, I have to, of course, this inter information is going to be in the, is not going to be in the internet, or perhaps it's not going to be that obvious, but I know that I have to get a degree from high school, I have to get work experience in between, uh, or even work and study at the same time, I have to uh, get bachelor degree and not just any bachelor degree, but perhaps from a good university in specific area with a specific grades, so I can get into masters and so on. Uh, but this is me deciding that, well, this is the path. Perhaps there are some other people 
who are just geniuses and who are just being noticed uh, in the middle of their path and they don't even manage to uh, finish it. Or there are some others who do something accidentally and they get to specific positions or it's just by connections, just because your family knows someone and then they know someone and so on. And suddenly you just get a position which you technically don't deserve, but you're there. And you can call it anyway, but in the end of the day, it's you deciding what you would like to do. It's what it's you deciding what you're capable of. And of course, in the modern world, we can reduce, but that's where, where I don't like reductionism, where I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure you would like to ask me a question, but what about the people who are less fortunate, less privileged? And I mean, here, of course, yes, I can say that, well, some inequality is something that exists in our world, and it's sad. It's, uh, it's very sad that uh, bright kids cannot apply to specific schools, universities, just they don't have money or the government is being unfair in terms of grants and giving the scholarships out to even those who are already privileged enough. And of course I call this unfair, but you, uh, there are some, some things that you can battle against and you cannot win. And you can try to battle against, but you're not gonna be able to change the system as a whole. Unfortunately, it's not just you, it's the whole system has to change. So what you can do here in no matter what, privileged or not privileged or high class, low class, you can always try. I, I encountered in my life different types of people coming from different social statuses that uh, actually have a better position than me in work, that actually have a higher education than me. And yeah, of course, I will hear from them that they were working day and night and studying at the same time and not sleeping probably for like three years, more than five hours. It's, it's hard work. It's very inspiring when you hear uh, about those people. And then you understand that reality is relatively tough, but it's possible. And when you see those people who prove that, well, they can be masterful, they can achieve whatever they want just because they desire it, you know, it's, it's amazing. You can see how this world generally works and how you can apply it. But then you have a counter example of those privileged kids who, let's say, or privileged people, not even kids, privileged people in general, who have all those amazing opportunities, but don't use them. Just because they're saying that, well, I don't want this. I don't have time for this. They're being lazy, let's say. And in the end of the day, those, those opportunities never re repeat again. They never appear in their lives and they lose something. Uh, so th that's, in my understanding, being masterful is finding different opportunities and not just saying no to them, but evaluating them and as much as you can saying yes to them. Because there is a small chance that every single opportunity can bring something amazing to your life. Perhaps some people will say not support you, will say that it is stupid, it's unrational. But I mean, if you don't say yes to it, if you don't try, you will never know. And the same way, if you say no to it, well, you perhaps miss the best opportunity of your life. It's just someone else will take it and they will be lucky instead of you. So it's not a question of, you know, inequality or in this, in this matter. I mean, just make realize how broad reality truly is and how open to abstraction it is because we have metaphysical speculations about the world the external reality we have ontological speculations about our existence and then we have epistemological uh, speculations about the objects around us and and we're all trying to first of all, like exist, but at the same time, understand why are we here? And so, you know, when the whole social aspect comes in play in, in, in our civilization, in our community, there's always this question, oh, why was I born poor? Or why was I born rich? Like, why is there this sort of distinction within our reality? So people would try to answer those questions through, through religious, uh, you know, speculations or, or their own, uh, or completely deny it and say, you know, society is basically just a construct. So if we're born into it, we're born into it. So there's like two ways of, you know, kind of questioning the social aspects of this reality that we exist in. And when I, you know, look at any kind of ontological speculations, I totally related to like, okay, this is an affective, uh, here's where, when I, where I try to combine philosophy with psychology is that I try to say 
oh, ontological speculations are just an affective way of looking at the world, or metaphysical speculations are an empirical way to examine the construct of reality and society too. And so these questions uh, are usually talked about, but they, you cannot derive a particular answer out of them because there is no answer. Like, that's what I feel like. I mean, there's, there's a lot of questions, there's a lot of meanings, there's a lot of ways we can answer it, but ultimately to conclude that, oh, objectively, I think this is one answer and it, you know, it basically answers everything. There's no one such answer objectively that every subjective person or if every you know subjective persona could be like oh i relate to this because there's a sense of relation there's a sense of uh, association when we try to navigate through all these different meanings and come into one conclusion and it makes it makes a uh, total sense you know sometimes when you look at the construct of society now we're in 2020 we have you know, severe ways to just transport ourselves, but there's no way to transport ourselves instantly. Maybe we'll reach there one day, you know, but there's still not that one particular way, you know, we can blend metaphysics and ontology and epistemology and go to this one direction because as you mentioned, you know, there are different effects, like you mentioned domino effect. We, you know, usually consider cause and effect, like the causal relations as kind of basic and inherent to reality, right? But when I say reality is broad, but also open to abstraction, is that we can also say, you know, effect can do a cause. So that's what we see in artistic, uh, you know, um, the ways people try to de derive meaning within life. Artists, authors, especially authors who write about fiction reality, so dystopia, utopia, they try to blend reality according to their imagination in a way that the abstraction that comes out of that, that the abstraction, which is the end product, uh, is usually something that we would say, oh, that is not possible. Like, how can effect cause something? Because it's already happened, because it's in the future, right? So it's also mixing up the timelines. But then you see uh, creative artists like Christopher Nolan, you know, he, uh, in his movie, the recent one, Tenet, he basically blended all these different concepts that we have and he showed, oh, there's this, this way also to look at reality. So there's also this abstractive element there. And so within all this abstraction and, and reality that we have, how are we going to conclude objectively, oh, this is the one reason why everything's happening or this is the one reason why we're all here. So I feel like you know, there's a lot of ways, and as you said, you know, humans have a tendency to uh, do what it, what they like ultimately. So the reason why I would pursue a certain uh, section of academia is because I most relate to it. So that's where the re relation comes in and association. So we as humans, by default, you know, are, are structured in a way that we try to pick up things which are, you know most pleasing to us so there's like a satisfaction level as well so that's where we try to ontologically speculate the meaning of our existence so you know a lot of people say artists are pseudo mystics or artists are you know uh, more uh, likely to have psychotic illnesses in them it's because we're not ready to accept the reality that artists can speculate reality through abstraction in a way that they can derive meaning within their abstraction and be okay with it completely. Uh, you know, we have a lot of artists today who paint, who, uh, you know, sing through musical, you know, musical uh, speculations, we can say, you know, they, they try to, everyone in one way or the other is trying to ultimately understand reality by the way they choose to live their life. So, you know, we have a lot of books nowadays, you know, about how to live your life or the subtle art of not giving a fuck, you know, books like that. I, I just like, it, it just comes into my mind that there's no one, yeah, maybe a lot of people would be able to relate to that one way, but, you know, ultimately it comes down to the association and relation aspect of human psychology that we as humans would always either intuitively or, you know, uh, 
interest wise connect to this one particular method to derive meaning so we're all just on a journey but that's the thing there's no one objective way even you know when i try to in my own like studies try to understand what's you know the objective it is very hard to determine the objectives because i feel like you know the objective would ultimately be my subjective objective like there's no one true yes yeah there's gravity but may, we can bend gravity too like this dark matter out there this matter out there that we don't know about that we can you know totally artistically bend you know it's it's possible that's you know that's why i say reality is very much open to abstraction too so you know reality is also a construct in a way because we created this whole aspect of oh, what's real what's unreal so you know we can go on and on about this one particular philosophical speculation as to why we're here what we're doing where we're going but there's no one true you know subjective or objective answer that i feel like everyone in this planet could relate to so you know like you're interested in philosophy uh, and 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 Foucault as you said and Foucault talked about a lot of things you know one of the most interesting things i think that i you know recently read in my um you know s- studies was that panopticism right we discussed that in our one of our years and it was one of the best just idea or or in in a thinking uh you know that i feel like was very very that was almost revolutionary at that point because you know during that century we had Foucault was you know peers with Sartre he was peers with all these different french intellectuals and he had his own different philosophy where he he came into conclusion that we're all being surveyed or like uh we're all being observed constantly you know like i have a laptop in front of me yes we're able to communicate but maybe there's someone else also watching who knows right so that was one of the most interesting things i don't know like what do you think about panopticism like and and especially now that we have zoom and you know i feel like pre covid there was not that much uh, speculation about panopticism but because of covid and after covid and like we're still in covid you know there's an increased uh you know globalization increased age of information increased use of digital you know mediums that i feel like panopticism now being an idea from 19th century is much more uh much more observed or much more realized so what do you think about panopticism and and now i think the idea of panopticism is um i mean it always existed that's first of all i mean uh, in order to understand i think it's important to uh define what it is and in in the contemporary age it is the fact that we are being observed um throughout uh, every we been be, we've been observed every uh, single day and i'm not necessarily uh speaking of through the camera of zoom or something uh we we can uh, leave this out i think when we're going out let's say there are cctv cameras everywhere and uh i think this is also related to what uh Foucault was generally saying this is uh, this is the way um, this is why he was so uh, fond of nietzsche uh because nietzsche had similar ideas he was not speaking about panopticism he was just speaking about something else but i will bring it, it up later on um but first about panopticism so the idea is that we we been observed every single day this is the reason why he was against universal uh rules for everyone this is why he was not so fond of um uh, rousseau or marx or kant because all of those guys were just trying to universally define something create universal ethics morals uh which were supposed to be good for the people and of course we'll take something that is a creation of modern uh centuries of such a uh, such thing i'm speaking about is a social contract yeah of course it binds us together of course it dictates specific rules and gives you different cool features uh which allow you to exist in our society such as you going out uh, to shop let's say to buy a bottle of beer and you're not going to be attacked and killed well you, of course no one takes this possibility out but at least uh the person who is going to police was planning to do this was planning to rob you or do something uh he or she will be aware of the fact that will he or she is observed 
there is always this CCTV camera. There is this sense of security that you personally have because of the social contract. But what happens at the end of the day when it was created, um, even the creator uh, of the person who coined the terms, the social contract or so was uh, speaking about things such as uh, whenever we're, we're born free, but you know, nevertheless, we're, we're everywhere, we're in chains. And this is the thing, like you're forced into this social contract in the end of the day, you're, you're not just, no one asks you a, questions, a question anymore when you're brought into this world, uh, both, and I'm both, I'm speaking about being born into this world and just brought into the society, let's say someone from indigenous tribe. If you want to be part of the society, you are part of the society. There is no other uh, way you can dictate the rules. You cannot just come in and say, well, I do not like, that I'm being observed through CCTV camera throughout my whole walk. Well, sorry, if you would like to be part of the society, you have to accept it because this is how the society operates. And this is where we are giving away uh, our freedom for this so-called safety. And again, this freedom as well, uh, the, the safety again, is it, not really safety. Right now, we can see that um, how this uh, safety in fact kind of works uh, because through the throughout these recordings through the way we're being observed we're, we, we can be easily controlled we can be easily manipulated uh, there are a variety of ways the governments have already proved that they can use uh, those cameras uh, not just against the people I would say they of course it is used for, as precautions as something that would protect us against let's say in this case it's the pandemic but nevertheless it's something that is giving information about us constantly, um, which I would say is became something that in, um, takes away our privacy completely. Now it's not just a question of freedom that was taken away because I, I divide freedom and privacy. Now, even you, when you have been home, it's not necessarily, you're not necessarily, uh, you cannot just have a private conversation even currently. Like it doesn't matter from Zoom or WhatsApp or anything. It's a fact now that whenever you speak about something in WhatsApp, Facebook gives you adverts. And we're like, at a certain moment, we're thinking of, wow, how, how does Facebook know that I want uh, uh, this grill? Well, yeah, I was speaking about this grill with my friend, uh, let's say, Sam. It's a cool grill, but for some reason, he knows exactly what I want. He knows that I want this grill with like four different options. And he's giving me an amazing price. So like, this is how it works now. If it was before, it was just uh, for safety. Now it's, it's going a little further. This is where uh, uh, there is a control over our freedom and which is complete control of our freedom. And you have to uh, be aware of it. You have to be uh, to understand that this is not something, this is not just a coincidence because in general, there is no coincidences. And uh, uh, this is where panopticonism uh, steps in. It takes away freedom it takes away your privacy and uh, we just have to understand that it's not going to just stop on a simple idea of cctv cameras being there it's not going to stop on the idea of data mining it's not going to stop on simple ideas and this is not uh conspiracy theories or whatever uh, i believe that governments try to do the best they can protect but uh, again i'm not going to go into this uh, topics deep enough because everyone has their own interests so this, this is what is important to understand. And government is a completely different structure. It's, a, it's an institute as well, and we give it power. And at a certain moment, people who gave it power uh, don't actually have a possibility to take the power away from the government itself. And it's uh, stopped being a democracy or stops being whatever we call it. It's uh, the same idea as you can call democracy a democracy, but in the end of the day, it doesn't follow exactly the rules of democracy as it's supposed to. Everything changes every time whenever there is someone new coming in with their personal interests, and uh, that, that's how it works. And I think Nietzsche was uh, given also an idea of what's going to interfere with our culture, what's going to interfere with our progress. And this progress is when we're going to start giving attention and paying attention to a specific I said when we're going to try to deal with the uh, specific problems that we have in, in a wrong way, that at a certain moment when we're going to try to destroy completely discrimination, completely take away inequality, 
uh, completely doing this and this. It might be for the good cause. And it is for the good cause. Of course, no one likes inequality. Of course, no one likes discrimination and segregation. It's bad. It's terrible. And uh, I, I believe that no one should experience it. But unfortunately, we live in the world where it exists. It happens. It is happening currently. It was happening before. And it will happen in the future. As much as we don't want it to be, uh, in the end of the day, our actions just create those conditions. And we can look at the previous uh, of historic events that actually happened this year, uh, which were terrible. And of course, uh, I'm speaking about um, uh, discrimination of specific group of people or even the, min the minorities, everything. It's, uh, I'm not against them. I completely adore what is happening. And I believe this is great for our humanity. But in the end of the day, this is what Nietzsche was paying attention to. When we're giving too much power to specific groups, when we're giving specific, when we're trying to make something better, when we're trying to uh, cancel out whatever we did, we're destroying our culture, we're destroying whatever was there. And we're not looking at the history, we're kind of repeating the history all over again. We're just, we, we are naming it differently. We are, uh, in, instead of actually correcting it, we're doing every possible side action, instead of just simply just striking the goal and just dealing with it. Uh, it's the same as destroying the monuments. It's the same as uh, creating a variety of different groups. It's the same as banning different authors and so on. Instead of just doing this, there are specific actions that one, uh, one can do in order to, uh, to change the world in this manner. But the truth is that if human beings really wanted to change the world, this action would have been taken. Instead, something else is done because we just try to come up with the new ways but we don't want to look and to observe uh, what history is showing us and this is where panopticism, uh, panopticism comes in as Foucault was saying as well because right now it's just before we had prisons and before it was just a context before like we what if we live in the same kind of prison what if it is right now it's just a digital prison in terms of oh we have a city and we have these cameras around well ain't it the same form of prison that um, exists for those who committed crimes, let's say? We're being observed like we're animals in the zoo, let's say. We, we are still, we, we're being under control. And in the end of the day, the only ones whose fault is that is the human beings who actually desire to have this, desire to have the safety, which we are now suffering and trying to change because we want more freedom. But as soon as we're going to gain more freedom, again, there are going to be talks about well, I'm scared. I don't want that much freedom. I want everything to be safe again. And it's just going to go on and on and on and on, which is uh, beautiful in, in a certain sense and uh, actually resembles uh, the zeitgeist. It's the same as before we were all about consumerism. Everything about spending money on specific things. Oh, I want a new laptop because it's cool. Oh, I want a new iPhone because, you know, it's pretty. Um, if I have a last iPhone, you know, it means I have a, sp a specific social status. It means I'll have a beautiful, I, I can make different selfies. I can make selfies every hour and then, or every 10 minutes and just post on Instagram and everyone can like it and so on. Well, yeah, but now it's changing again because it's not consumerism anymore. Now we found something else. Now it's very popular to root for all, let's say the minorities, for all the groups that have been offended. And the funny thing is, is the same people who were probably putting offensive stuff on the internet and still are being offensive. It's just, they don't really know about it. They, they just follow the trend that exists. So that's what I'm trying to say in this way. And this panopticism can be looked uh, from different points. It's not just uh, surveillance. It's literally uh, everything that we as human beings create around us. We give it meaning, we define it, and we make it uh, incredibly valuable. Uh, that's why Facebook and Instagram and every, all those platforms have such power over, over us. If everyone is going to not boycott it, but say, well, we don't, if, we, if we really don't want this data mining, if we really don't want WhatsApp and Facebook uh, to know what kind of grill you want or what you're speaking with friends, you know, it's relatively easy to stop it. But in the end of the day, if people actually wanted, they would have done it. So the same goes to everything else in my understanding. So going back to when you said, oh, like I'm going to my Instagram and I see, oh, I, I like I'm interested in buying these type of shoes, but how did Instagram know? 
but this is what I'm looking for. So there's a really good documentary out there on Netflix called The Social Dilemma that basically unfolds, you know, what's happening, um, at least, you know, panopticist, panopticism wise, currently in our civilization. And you're 100% right about, uh, you know, history repeating itself true. I remember when I was like sitting in my bed and like all this thing is happening, you know, Black Lives Movement and like Trump and like all, just all of this, you know, within and also there's like a global pandemic going on. Uh, I'm just like, okay, so how do I solve all of this problem? Like, what can I do to solve what's going on right now? Because there's a public health crisis and there's a crisis uh, of human rights. And so in order for those human rights to be recognized or somehow compromised by the government, they have to protest. But if they're gonna protest, there's going to be less social distancing. And so the public health factor gets affected uh, because of that. So how do I devise like a structure or, or an idea in order to solve all of these problems with Turns out there, there is no one such idea. Like we think democracy is the ultimate, you know, good social structure that we as humans can live in. But is it really? Because democracy is also flawed. It is flawed because it implies individualism. And if everyone is going to be an individualist, they're going to have their own ideas and they're going to like their ideas more than anyone else's. And so how is a communal consensus going to come out of this thing? There's going to be no consensus. And so if there's no consensus, there's no civilization because no one you know, agrees uh, about things like the other people do. And so I was sitting down and I was thinking, oh, maybe we should try creating new models. Why are we pertaining to democracy, communism, socialism? Maybe we can try to create new models because the way time goes is that we we ascend into the future. And so if we're just going to come, you know, like take the past and you know put it in the present and, and somehow also try to create something, it's we're never truly going to move forward. You know, we're like, this is 2020, we still have human rights problems. We, we still have all these basic human problems that, you know, people would think, you know, oh, that should not exist because it's 2020, you know, like liberalism and everything, but it exists, it exists. First of all, I feel like the basic one problem is the lack of education, you know. We, we think that everyone has a certain sense of knowledge about the world, but not everyone has ha access. As you say, you know, the social element comes in. Not everyone uh, has the same access to education as someone else would. And so, you know, maybe the first thing we should try to do is educate people. Oh, you're, you're a human being. The reason why we have basic sciences or basic, uh, you know, history or basic any of uh, these things in our formative years, like in middle school and in, in, in high school almost, you know, we have the same syllabus more or less worldwide. The reason why we have it is that we want to educate the people coming into this world that this is what the world is. And so now you know, and so now you can go and make whatever you want to make out of it. But if, if at a very basic level, you know, in the society, uh, there's a section of people who do not understand what, you know, the world really is or how it really works, there's always going to be problems. Like there's no way, you know, we can, we can surpass this problem. So, you know, I, so I wrote down in my diary that maybe, you know, education, that's where we should start. So that's also like a reductionism way that, that I'm trying to reduce it to one problem. But problems are there, problems are even there with education, educated people, you know, there are educated retards out there that, that are educated, but still won't be able to understand certain subjects. So how do we deal with those people? That's a problem. And, uh, and now we have, you know, this increased digital atmosphere where everyone, you know, is being observed. More or less every human being is on, you know, certain kind of social media platform. And so one way to tackle this, people came up with cryptocurrency. So they're like, okay, so in order to make transactions not that much visible in the eyes of the government or in the eyes of the other people or tax authorities, maybe we should try creating Bitcoins and all sorts of cryptocurrency in order to remain secretive. And now there are also like apps and stuff that you can you know, send messages and it disappears. So like there's an app called Wicker, there's Telegram, there's so many apps like that. And so, there's like an increased sense of maintaining uh, 
uh, uh, like personal autonomy to, to, uh, to a highest level within every human being. And, but we're also trying to exist co, you know, like as a community because this world cannot go forward if everyone has a problem with everyone else. And so how do we, how do we try to solve this problem from one angle? We can, we can never do that. The, the, the answer to these questions are never democracy or a certain kind of political system. Because we think that you know there are certain there are certain people on certain higher levels in society, and that they must have the answers or they must have the resources. They may have the resources, and they might have the solutions to your problems. But to what level do you think they're going to come to you and 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 lay it all out for you? You as a human being ultimately are you know the own judgment. Uh, passing authority for yourself so if if i like especially with the whole you know uh, blm movement that happened back in may and april everyone's you know going crazy people are looting people are you know taking protests to you know higher levels you know destroying monuments and and uh, forcibly you know using violence as a way to you know oh we we, we want human rights but that's ultimately now not how you're going to get it because you're opposing human rights while you're demanding for it at the same time protests are such a you know such a social thing now so i would always like you know advise people yes go to protests because you know how how else how else is one sort of government going to realize that there's a problem within the system you have to make some kind of noise in order for the higher authorities to understand oh there's a problem here but you know taking it to extreme levels and justifying looting as a way of trying to get government's attention is so unjustified because they don't realize that they are destroying humanity in in order to you know somehow also say oh we're demanding human rights but that's not how you do it and so there's always you know these small small issues at such primitive levels so you cannot you just cannot solve it like that you have to have a thinking mind, which every human being has in this world, and, and a certain level of empathy. So everyone is able to understand what the other person is trying to say. So that's where the consensus comes in. You need to have a consensus in order for a civilization to exist. So that's why we have, oh, we have physics, we have gravity. So th these are agreed upon laws, right? But at a very societal level, there's always a disruption because we all have individual individualistic ideas we have all we all have our own uh, understanding of the universe so you know there's that problem and that problem is how are you going at a very individual level going to bend your interests in order to recognize the others and then also in in order to you know survive in harmony how are you going to bend these ideas within yourselves so there's a conflict between you know your own ideas about the world and what the other things so that's i feel like you know today's main problem is is trying to deconstruct society and and understand oh where are we coming from or why is this problem here because like now we have i'm pretty sure like now that we have vaccines and stuff every at one point it's going to be you know some people are already saying oh vaccines are there, there are people who don't believe in vaccines, right? So some people are already like, I'm not going to take vaccines or I'm not going to, you know, inject this thing that Pfizer or Moderna or any pharmaceutical company has come up with because I don't know what is in there. You know, it can give me some sort of anxiety or whatever. But scientists, on the other hand, would be like, no, you should definitely take uh, vaccines in order to not only protect yourself, but the other. So there's like an interest for the other. I feel like there's going to be another problem now that we have like this whole distribution going on. How do you think this is going to play out? Because distribution of vaccines can take up to three to four months, like at large. And, and, and everyone's either going to be, oh, I'm for vaccines or I don't care about vaccines. And there's going to be some sort of societal disruption from that. And, and I don't know how humans are going to look at this problem unless they're educated about it, you know. 
Well, look, I mean, um, I don't have enough information to actually give opinion or to speak about this topic. But in general, there are a couple of things um, that one has to understand that it's relatively, it's going to be relatively hard to force everyone to uh, be vaccinated. Because in order to this to occur, one has to deal with such as human right as being able to uh, be free over your own body. So. You cannot just say, well, you cannot just write in the new uh, law saying that, well, everyone has to be vaccinated. You be, otherwise, you're going to be excluded from the society. Uh, this is basically a violation of very, very basic human rights. So if this happens, well, that's just one side of the argument. And this is relatively hard to see how people are going to uh, react to this, because it's, to a certain degree, I can agree with it. To a certain degree, I can disagree. It. Agree from the point of view that, well, if you want it to be over uh, and if the vaccines are working, because, again, we need to give it time. We don't really know when everything is going to come back to normal. And if there was a 100% chance, then, uh, you know, uh, governments, nations would be speaking about it. But it's not happening. So uh, when uh, I guess we will see the 100% news, then that's something. But again, this is a question of trust and so on. But the first argument is uh, if we want it to be over, and then everyone should be vaccinated. OK, this is acceptable, but you cannot force every single human being. Uh, because this way you also lose trust. It's a human right to say that, well, I don't trust what is in the vaccine. Uh, although, on the other, other hand, if it is working and if it is proved and it works on majority of people, there is no casualties, there is nothing like this, then it's a total different story. There are too many factors that would influence it. And the end of the day, I believe that uh, right now it's tough times and we should uh, just understand that, well, major a lot of people suffer. Uh, from uh, this pandemic and it's our whole it's it's a battle for all of us to make sure that we return to normal and uh, it's important to understand that if certain groups are going to react to it in a way that well we don't want to contribute it is their uh, design not to contribute to everyone's health in terms of uh, you cannot just say no just out of your personal preferences sometimes you have to do something that is not just you can of course it is a question of I want to or not want to but it is this time it's a question of I need to and the same goes to me I cannot say what my opinion in terms of vaccines or if I trust them if I don't trust them or something like this because I want to hear the news I like to uh, I, I want to read some reports and if those reports already exist beautiful and perhaps and of course they exist already and I read some of them, but still, I would like to receive more information. And at the end of the day, uh, currently, there is no access to vaccines. When they will, they will be in excess, and there will be a need of me to be vaccinated uh, for the greater good of the humanity in terms of every, everything returning to normal, then it is, my, uh, it is my obligation to be part of it. So in, in this way, because of course I'm suffering too, I want everything to return to normal. So if this will uh, go against my desire and me saying, well, I don't want something to be put in my blood, but then it is something that uh, is going to allow everything to return to normal, well, the, situ the uh, solution is quite obvious for me. So I think it will divide the world into two opinions, perhaps three or four as usually, but uh, it's just a matter of time. It's uh, if we want everything to be normal or not normal, but it will be totally an interesting, um, it, it will be an interesting time to see how we as human beings uh, will operate because uh, as many say that this is the first time the whole world is kind of working together uh, I believe they've been moments when the world will, world was working together uh, beforehand is just right now there are too many variables. We since then we made everything way more complex. Uh, there are and those complications uh, they do make the situation way harder. That's why there are so many uh, variables that uh, every single nation had to take in account, such as human rights uh, and. Uh, um, I really hope that at those moments, if everything will be working, uh, we're not going to encounter such problem with the prices for the vaccine, the availability 
of vaccines uh, because right now it's not a question of who has the money for it or whatever. And I believe this is the time where our uh, population, well, our, our nations are gonna be checked in terms of how um, they treat every single person within uh, the country. So uh, there is no, it's not a time for uh, discrimination of social classes because you cannot just take away one group because this group can really make the, complete, uh, the situation way harder. So you have to give access to, vaccine, uh, to vaccines to everyone. And I think this will be a positive change to a certain degree because uh, perhaps uh, the governments will see that if you give this medical attention to everyone and if you give resources to everyone, perhaps it's not such a bad thing. We're not going to know now, but uh, future seems to be relatively interesting. I think that's uh, my uncertain opinion about the situation. Uh, I'm just looking forward to see what 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 will happen. True, like even I am. I'm just sitting tight and and just seeing how things are going to ultimately play out with the distribution of these mRNA vaccines. But I feel like we covered so much content within this frame of time. Uh, that's amazing. Yeah. But yeah, like on that note, I think we can, you know, end this podcast and, and hope everyone, you know, turns out fine. And if, if, if vaccines are indeed available to you and you see them as safe, you should take them uh, not only for yourself, but also for the good of others. Uh, but yeah, everyone, stay healthy, stay safe. And thank you, Mark, for coming on the podcast. It's super interesting. I'm going, I'm going to have you over all the time uh, because you're one of my closest friends. And so it's, it's, you know, it's amazing that we can two just sit together. You're in Russia, I'm here. And have, you know, a head-to-head -head good conversation about how, you know, what is philosophy? What is panopticism? And what are the discussions around or speculations around COVID vaccines at the moment? We covered a good amount of uh, stuff. Thank you. Thank you for coming over. I, I want to thank you for uh, having me on the podcast. Uh, it was a great conversation and a great dialogue that we uh, had. Uh, we indeed covered a variety of topics. I believe it's, uh, it's, relative, it's very insightful to have those kind of conversations in order to allow uh, yourself to think more about certain subjects, not even to uh, give the information to someone, but just for your own good. And uh, I really hope that uh, this is uh, what this podcast uh, is aiming to do, is uh, to uh, just give people uh, a certain understanding that it's important to think about all, the, all of those topics of every single topic and not just to say, no, I'm not interested, but just to even try to think about it, even for one or two minutes. That brings in itself a huge difference into the world, in my, in my opinion. There is no stupid or not smart ideas. Is that There are ideas, there is thinking, and uh, this, uh, the process is beautiful in its core. So I really uh, hope that your podcast is going to cover more uh, interesting topics. And I'm sure uh, that you will speak with more uh, people who are interested in a variety of spheres too. So wishing you the best of luck. And uh, thank you very much for having me again. Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure. Yeah.